Thank you for joining me on Synthesis Workshop. On today's Total Synthesis episode, we'll take a look at the recent total synthesis of Scabrolidae by the Stoltz Group at Caltech. Scabrolidae is a marine natural product isolated from coral in 2002 and has been shown to have some potentially promising properties as an anti-inflammatory agent. In the retrosynthetic analysis of this target, the Stoltz Group imagined that if you were to reconnect the beta carbon of the enone and the carbonyl of the cycloheptanone, it might be possible to apply an oxidative fragmentation tactic that would originate from a cyclobutanol starting material. The virtue of this type of cyclobutanol as a synthetic intermediate is that you could think about accessing it through a 2 plus 2 cyclization process, where the alcohol may arise from the Tamau Fleming oxidation of a silane, which in turn could be installed by a hydrosilylation reaction. Going back further, they envisioned that this intermediate could be further simplified by applying a Diels-Alder reaction on an appropriate precursor, which would require some type of oxidation process to install the ketone. Retrosynthetically cutting by an esterification at the bottom would then allow us to divide this intermediate into two roughly equal sized pieces, which we'll call fragment alpha and fragment beta, just to change things up a little bit from our normal routine. First, let's check out fragment alpha to see how they go about making that. Starting from linalool, they used a ring closing metathesis followed by a TBS protection to arrive at this enantio enriched allylic alcohol. Then, treatment with ruthenium trichloride and tert butyl hydroperoxide resulted in an allylic oxidation, which led to this enone. Carrying on the enone and doing a conjugate addition with vinyl magnesium bromide and copper bromide DMS, they got a pretty diastere selective addition to the bottom face of the ring, although the exact stereochemical outcome ends up being inconsequential in two steps. Then, using lithium tetramethylpapyridine and test chloride, they arrived at this silyl enol ether, which could be subjected to DDQ and get to this dienone. Now, they used a diastereoselective loose reduction to set the stereochemistry of the secondary alcohol and remove the TBS group with TBAF. At this point, they had completed the synthesis of the piece we're calling fragment alpha. Now, let's have a look at fragment beta and see what their approach to this one was. To get at this fragment, they started from this chiral aldehyde, which can be obtained in five steps from carbone. To convert the aldehyde into a protected alkyne, they executed a cori fuchs sequence, followed by treatment with acid, which allowed them to deprotect the acetal and reveal the aldehyde. Now, executing a second cori fuchs sequence, this time with a CO2 trap, allowed them to form the alkynoic acid, at which point they used TBAF to remove the TMS group from the first alkyne they installed. With that, they had fragment beta ready to go. Now, taking a look at their fragment coupling strategy, they used DIC and DMAP to do a steglic esterification and form the ester. Putting that intermediate in xylenes at 140 got the Diels-Alder reaction to go, and directed epoxidation with vanadium and TBHP gave the epoxide in a highly diastereoselective fashion. Then, they found that they could use Gansauer's radical reductive opening of epoxides with titanium, which is presumably going through this type of ring-opened intermediate, and the radical is getting trapped in a hydrogen atom transfer with 1,4-cyclohexadiene. Then, IBX could be used to bring up the alcohol to the ketone. Now, trying to perform a hydrosilylation 2 plus 2 sequence, the authors carried out a ruthenium catalyzed hydrosilylation and subjected the product to a radiation with 350 nanometer light, but were surprised to find that this was the product they obtained. This is the product of a cyclization with a non silylated alkene, marked in blue. You can see how, in the target structure they were going for with this step, they were trying to engage the alkene marked in red in the 2 plus 2 rather than the blue one. So, how do you get around that kind of selectivity issue? They decided to go back to the E9 intermediate that we had at the beginning of the last slide and treat with MCPBA, which gave a mixture of diastereomers by epoxidation of the terminal alkene. Then they used the same sequence as the last slide, doing a ruthenium catalyzed hydrosilylation followed by a 2 plus 2 by irradiation with 350 nanometer light to get the desired cyclobutane product, with which they carried out another reductive epoxide opening with titanosine dichloride, manganese, and 1,4-cyclohexadiene. This provided a mixture of diastereomers at C15. It's worth noting that this 2 plus 2 is proposed to go by having the alkene approach the enone from the convex face, which results in a 1,7 cyclization to give a 1,4 diradical that can close to form the transfused 6,4 junction in the cyclobutane product. In this next step, they found that using a mercury-mediated to Fleming oxidation, they could convert the silyl group into a hydroxyl group, which set up the cyclobutanol for the key fragmentation step they were planning. But first, to converge their epimers and get rid of the primary alcohol, they used a Grieco dehydration, which got back to the terminal alkene. Now, to do the key fragmentation step, they found that copper iodide and N-iodosuccinamide triggered a radical fragmentation and recombination step that resulted in the cleavage of the cyclobutane ring and the expansion to the cycloheptanone. Finally, the beta iodine could be eliminated to arrive at scabrolid A. I enjoyed reading about the synthesis a lot, and I think it was creative and ambitious to take the path through the cyclobutane, and the authors found some innovative steps along the way that I think are pretty instructive. 
Thank you for joining us today on this Total Synthesis episode. If you enjoyed it, please support us by liking and subscribing, and feel free to send us any questions and comments you have. Follow us on Twitter to stay up to date, and see you all next time.